Collard in December 1995, um, and it's, it then really got going the following year. It was a transition period from being a sole trader. I'd been a sole trader for a few years prior to that, but then with getting into the demolition industry, um, running some trucks on the road, we got advised legally to, to go limited. Um, that was really the landmark of really when things started to snowball in, in my working career and it very pro progressively became quite an animal to what our Collard is now employing over 250 people and it's, um, it's rapidly still growing which is a great pleasing sight for me at the moment. But don't, I worked for my father for a few years when I left school and um, families have different opinions and it's very hard working for your dad so I bucked the trend of some people in our demolition industry and uh, went on my own. And it was it was a great it was a very difficult time a difficult decision. Um, my father still trades with his company now, M Collard Waste Disposal. It's, it's it's still a very big, recognised waste firm, and that gave me a little bit of the knowledge of, of the waste industry. But I had a lot more passion for demolition, and he didn't have any any desire to be a demolition contractor. So when when I made the break and went on my own. I had a clear vision that I wanted to be a, one of the top demolition companies in the country. There's a lot more to demolition than just literally knocking down a building. When I was doing demolition I couldn't understand some of these old traditional demolition companies that would only knock down a building, they wouldn't do the slab removals or take out the foundations, they never had their own transport facilities, they never had any recycling capacity. And you have to look at how the industry has changed in the last 20 years and I think a lot of people are quite slow to react and that, that allowed me a, a good opportunity to grow my company very quickly with some progressive sort of innovations in the fact that we wanted to um, recycle waste on site. You know, I used my knowledge from working for my father's company for recycling waste, um, bringing, either doing it on site or bringing it off site to a transfer station. You didn't have to have that link between a transfer station and a demolition contract which is a transport department. Now virtually every demolition company nowadays has a, a transfer station, they now have you know some trucks and they also do they have demolition. So I think to be competitive in a demolition world at the moment you've got to be able to have all three of those key elements so you have more control. Um, and that's really predominantly how I always wanted to be was to have the complete control so when you go to a client you, you sell the complete package. You said we can knock this building down, but we can also show you the complete waste stream and everything else that is generated from that. So it helps them score green points and, and it ticks a lot of boxes from the client. So that's what makes us stand out from the crowd. Um, there was a lot of people that would like, just knock down a building, ring up a subcontractor, do a haulage away, and it was never that person's problem anymore. The industry has become a lot more regulated and they want to see a cradle to grave sort of route of, of demolition, waste, recycling, and that's what we're doing. We're, we're trying to do sustainability, waste minimisation, so we can sell that to the client and say, when we knock this building down, we're going to take the window frames that might be plastic or they might be wood, and we're going to recycle them. You know, we're, we're going to send them plastic window frames off um, to be re-chipped into, into new plastic, and the wood's going to be sold off to, to generate power. So that's a, it's a great story on its own. And then, some, some demolition sites they want to keep the hard material on site, others actually want to get it rid of it because they haven't got the space or they've got too much, too much material. So we take that material away, we take it back, we crush it, we screen it, we, we're now into washing aggregates and um, you know, the next thing we'll be doing is doing concrete and that's the next thing for next year. We're going to start marketing um, doing ready mixed concrete which is basically all stemming from the demolition so it's a hand in glove process that people can see they can then use the, the concrete and the aggregates back on their new development. To have a transfer station you have a good source of material. If you're doing the demolition you are the source. So again it's another hand and glove process. So I've made a lot of investment in, in, in crushers and in wash plants. We spent two and a half million pounds last year building a new wash plant. What we're now making is, is a, a very pure fine sort of we're making uh, sharp sand, soft sand, we're making a, a 10 mil shingle you know, 20 mil shingle, 40 mil shingle, or reject stone. We can make all this stuff, so it's a no-brainer just to mix a bit of dust with with the sand and and the, and the shingle and make cement. And you you turn a a very very low value uh, material into a high value pr product, which again it just it helps complements everything that we do at Arcola Limited. And to make 
concrete that can go into foundations of an office block, you've got to use virgin materials. The recycled product is probably more at the lower end of the market for people building conservatories, maybe a garden wall, very low garage bases, that sort of stuff. So we're, we're going to be selling that to, a, to, the, to the lower end of the market. But technology is moving so fast now in, in recycled products, it's only a matter of time before it, it gets improved and you know, we can maybe start making a higher value concrete. Clients now are so much more um, aware of, of credit values, waste minimisation routes, so they want to see you know, if, it's, if that building is made of steel, they know they're not going to pay the same price they would if it was made of concrete. They're looking for credit values. So everything is about how much you can give the client back. And that's where the industry has changed so much. 20 years ago you, you gave the guy a price and they gave you the job or they didn't. Um, now you've got a massive big spreadsheet of credit value for this, credit value for that, you know, and you're, you're, you're breaking it down and they want to see that process. And if you're not a company that can offer that process, you're not going to win the work. We just do what we do and we try and do it the best as we can. Um, I, I think there's a lot of other people out there in our industry that are doing waste every bit as good as us. You know, we're, we're doing a, you know, a, a lot of volume, we're, we're turning out 50,000 tonnes of recycled product a month out of our quarries and recycling yards. We've got four recycling sites in Hampshire and Surrey between the M4 and the M3 corridor um, and, and the A3 corridor. So we can, we can go into London or we can go down, down to the coast very easily and, and service our demolition contracts. Um, the, the thing with waste, the waste is moving so fast at the moment. The technology out there, um, you could spend a million pounds every six months on waste with new equipment, new, new resources that are coming out, different styles of, of waste. You know, people are now they're bailing and wrapping waste and selling it and sending it to Europe, which I don't think is a good thing, if I'm honest. You know, the carbon footprint of us producing waste in the UK and, and putting it on, a, on an Eddie Stobart truck and it getting shipped out to Holland or Germany um, isn't good. They use that waste then to, um, to burn in concrete plants, cement plants, tarmac plants in Europe. Um, to generate electricity. I, I, I really don't see the, the, how that can work from a, from a carbon footprint point of view. We should be doing a lot more of incineration in the UK to generate our own electricity. Um, you know, we've still got coal-fired boilers in the UK. We shouldn't be using them. We should be using wood chip, you know, RDF, MRF style materials that, are, that can be um, produced from, from just general waste and also from demolition waste. You know, I've been racing the British Touring Cars now for just over 10 years. I celebrated my 400th um, career start in Touring Cars at the weekend, just gone at Croft. And I'm pleased to say, you know, I was, that race, I think I was, um, I was seventh in that race, but I then won race two, which was my 401st um, race start, so I won that, and that gave me my 50th um, podium. So that's, they're massive milestones in British Touring Cars. It puts me up there with a lot of the, the top drivers, not, not at the top by a long way yet, there's still a lot of people to beat, people like Jason Plato and Matt Neal, they've won multiple championships, so that's an area that I'm trying to go into. Um, but yeah, we're, we're doing very well, we've got the support of BMW, I'm racing for BMW at the moment, which takes up a lot of my time, you know, away from, from my demolition day-to-day um, -day job, so it's, uh, it, is a, it puts a lot of pressure on me. Juggling the two jobs is very tough at the moment, I must admit. We're right in the middle of the racing season. You know, I'm sitting here now after just coming back from Croft. I'm absolutely knackered if I'm honest. I feel my eyes have got like lead, lead, lead weights on them. But uh, it's tough, but you know, I live on adrenaline. I'm a sportsman through and through. You know, whatever we do, we do competitively and we do well. I try and teach that to my children and also to anybody that works here at Arcola Limited as a team. We try and use that ethos from sport. You know, we win together, we lose together. There's no way in team. We all come together, and it's it's a, it's a it's great when when that is there, and the whole team doesn't matter whether it's on a Sunday at a racetrack or you come into work on a Monday, and everybody's looking out for each other. Um, it's a good feeling. Trying to build a team, you you have to lead from the front when you're building a team, and you also have to prove to everybody. And it doesn't matter whether it's at the racetrack with the pit mechanics or you know, here on a Monday morning with the guys at work. If there's a problem, everybody helps. And I, I firmly believe that any good organisation, doesn't matter if it's a, a football team, you know, or, or a company doing demolition, you have to get involved and help the guys and the women 
whatever you do, you do together. So, you know, if, if I have to make a cup of tea, I'll make a cup of tea for all the guys. You know, if we have to go out and fix a, a digger because they can't get a hose sorted, I'll go out and I help the guys. I'm not, I sit here now and I'm always nice and clean and that's how my life has changed. You know, when I was building this company, I was there right at the forefront, fixing the diggers, driving the diggers, helping strip out the buildings with, with a crowbar. You know, the guys know I can do it and, and if I have to, I go back and do that. And it's the same with the race guys. You know, when I've crashed the car and there's a problem, I'm, I'll muck in and I'll help them guys, I'll pass them the spanners, I'll, I'll get there and I'll help fix the car because that's what we're about and I think when you build that with the guys, they've always, they're always, they've always got your corner, they've always got your back and you know, we, we go out and we have a curry and we have a beer after work or at the end of a race weekend and um, it's, it's great that you've got this massive team that we've been able to build around us and um, I'm very privileged and very honoured. As a family, we're, we're farmers by trade from a long time ago. My, father, my grandfather was a farmer, um, my father's still working, he's 70 years of age, he's got his own business, still, still trading, um, he goes to work every day. I don't see my life changing. I see Art Collard Limited becoming more professional. I feel like people choose to use Art Collard Limited because they, they know we're, we're there, we're passionate, we're at the forefront of, of, of demolition, forefront of recycling, forefront of... of Everything that, that you have to do to have sustainability in the current climate. You know, we, we're very competitive in our in our pricing, we give a good service and people give us repeat business and I think that's that's what people people like and we try and push ourselves as a brand. You know, the, the Collar brand has been around with me for 24, 25 years since I started as a sole trader and also from my father's business. He's been trading for 30, 40 years. It must be now on 40 years. So it's, um, you know, people know the name and they know it's a name that they can trust and whatever happens, we will always get their job done. I believe what gives my company the edge over a lot of the other demolition companies is the fact that when we look at a demolition project, we look at the, the, what is the waste arising isn't a waste. So we, we look at a demolition uh, contract, A, to get the job down to the floor level, but we then look at every demolition contract as a, as a waste recycling operation. So when that material is on the floor, we go into the segregation, and again, it's, it's segregating that waste as you bring the building down. It's no good just bringing it all down in one massive big heap because you then just got one big pile of junk, one big pile of waste. So we have to be very, very careful in how we take that building down. We're pulling the wood out, we're pulling the plasterboard out, we're taking the plastic out, the scrap metals, the high value metals, the coppers, the brass, that sort of stuff. But it's, it, it's so much more to just bring that building down. You then have to bring it down, put it on the floor, and take that waste, you know, which we then call a, a, a product. So I think there's a lot of difference in the terminology between a waste and a product. We look at this material that's coming from the horizons of demolition as a product, which we then can make into, we, we bring it back, we, we bathe it or we shred it, and we, take, we send that back out and we try and make that into a, a, a credit you know, it's a commodity. When you're selling plastics or polythene or wood, we look at it as, as, as a commodity. And that's where I think my company has that advantage over other, other industries. I believe it's very important to get young children into, into the demolition industry. It's an industry which is actually ageing and there's not a lot of young blood coming in. So apprenticeships is a great way to try and bring the children in. You know, we, we've got an open day actually coming up in our quarry. Um, Mid July, I guess, and we've written to all, all of the local schools to try and ask them to bring a, a, a half a dozen children from each school in so we can actually promote not just the demolition element of the business but also our the waste industry and the recycling that we do. So, people when they see trucks driving up and down the road, they know what's in that truck. Um, we're always at the, at the forefront of people not say complaining or criticising what we do, we can't do demolition without becoming a, um, a nuisance to the local community. So we always talk, we, we talk to the local community and we say to them, yeah, we, are, we cannot do demolition or waste removal without being a, a common nuisance. What we would try and do, we would do our utmost to bring that nuisance level to an absolute minimum. And that's all we can do. You can't do demolition without making noise, without making dust, 
without having vehicle movements. What we can only do as a professional company and as an industry is try and minimise that and, and prove to people that, that we are taking those measures and the company has got that commitment to society and, and the local community. Because you know, we get lots of people complaining, oh, your trucks are always up, going up and down our street in the village. You know, we can't avoid that. But what we can do, we can make sure that truck has got the lowest emissions, it's the latest, you know, the, the driver's got the latest CPC training. You know, they stick to the, um, to the speed limits. They sp stick to the working time regulations. We have to do all of that, and that's our commitment to society. The one thing I'd like to see in the demolition industry is a little bit more awareness, and, you know, just, just generally, and, and more money in it. You know, we've, the demolition industry is a, is a very, very tough, hard for industry to survive in. You know, it doesn't get a lot of recognition for the risks and the hard work that we put in at all levels of our industry. Um, we don't get rewarded enough, um, and that doesn't matter from, from where you're looking at, whether that's a guy that's pushing the wheelbarrows or using the mattock to, to, to strip a building or to the, to the crane operators driving the diggers. There should be more money involved in our industry. You know, it, it really does need more awareness for the risks that we have to do. You know, the environment that we have to work in sometimes. You're going into buildings that have been empty for 10, 20, 30 years, that have been left in an appalling state. These guys are working in, in very, very unpleasant conditions. You know, and then you've got the, the, the owners of the companies that are putting their lives on the line making personal guarantees, putting their houses up and there's great stories of people that have been successful and retired and ended up wealthy. There's also some tragic stories where people have lost their their livelihoods, their family homes because they've put everything on the line in a competitive industry. So if I could change one thing I'd want public awareness to be to be there for the developers to to choose the companies that they want to work with and reward the companies because I see a lot of developers making a lot of money at the moment and demolition companies really working on the bread line and it's it's not it's not a nice it's not a comfortable feeling. You know, I am getting older, you know, so it's only a matter of time before I stop racing or at the, the competitive level that I am racing at the moment. But you know, I will always be a demolition contractor, that's in my blood. And I will always race cars at some point that'll be in my blood. I'll be doing historic somewhere when I'm seventy. Um, because I just love racing, I love being part of it and I also love demolition, um, it's part of my life, it's part of where my future is going and it's what I want my two boys to do.